Um, he came actually to as a guest speaker twice in New York when, when we offered this course in New York. And you know, these sessions were so successful that I thought, look, now that we have moved everything online, all of a sudden I have access, you know, I'm lucky enough to have access to him again. And although he's very busy, I mean, he, he made some time for us this morning and which I really appreciate. Uh, Winnie, he's the founder and CEO of Empire Financial Research and, uh, and he's the editor of uh, Empire Investment Report. Actually, he's, if you sign up for his uh, distribution list, you will get information on, on investments, on investing uh, almost every day, Whitney, or? Yeah, um, I send out a free daily email um, to almost 40,000 people every day. And um, um, if anyone is interested in investing and you want to see how a 20 year veteran of the investing world, um, you know, sees things every day and what articles I find that are interesting and just sharing my you know, whatever's on my mind. Um, um, you know, I, I, I obviously I'm biased, but you can you can vouch for it. I think it's I think it's one of the. You know, I try to make it a little bit fun and provocative, um, include personal stuff of, you know, hey, I'm, I'm climbing the Matterhorn today while I'm sending you this email, that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> so, and then, so, and then I have uh, other paid newsletters ranging from $49 a year for a monthly newsletter focused on like big cap ideas, you know, retirement stocks for people, um, you know, ranging up to maybe $2,000 a year for my sort of, uh, you know, more aggressive stock newsletter where, you know, stocks that I think uh, can double in a year or two, um, you know, that's a little bit higher price newsletter, but the vast majority of my readers and my content is absolutely free to anyone who wants to sign up. You just go to empirefinancialresearch.com and put in your email address and you'll be on the list. Great. So uh, Whitney, well, as I said, it's the third time that comes here. Actually, he's very committed with education, you know, because uh, actually his his parents were both educators. Uh, he he spent part of his childhood in Tanzania, right, and Nicaragua. Yeah. Uh, your I think your parents were in the Peace Corps. Yes. And and uh, and so and also now um, he's doing a lot of uh, fundraisers. He's in the sitting in the board of some of uh, educational institutions. Um, like the KIPP schools, for example, uh, in, which is this uh, charter school that for me is, I mean, very impressive. I remember when I lived there that, uh, you know, I, I got to know this school and, and they are doing an impressive job in many places. And, and so he's always happy to join us and participating here and trying to have an impact on our students. So I, I'm really grateful for that. Um, we need before uh, being the founder of this uh, research company, he was a hedge fund manager um, for a number of years. He was uh, managing uh, his own hedge fund. And uh, actually, he had a very good call during the crisis, I think. And you even wrote a book about that, right? Uh, yeah. he's, he's the author of a couple of books, actually. One of them, which is, uh, as I was saying, more mortgage meltdown, six ways to profit mm -hmm. in these bad times, which was after the crisis or during the crisis. And the other one is the art of value investing. So precisely it's a book that it's very much related to the course we are teaching here. Um, he's an avid writer. He writes all the time, as I said, all these newsletters. Um, he shows in the media regularly. Maybe you have seen him in CNBC, Bloomberg TV. Um, he even has been featured in 60 Minutes. So um, you can find him in, in, in many different media outlets. Um, so, as I said in my introduction that I did before to my students, you are a sort of a mover and shaker in the New York scene, you know, and um, investor scene. And, uh, and finally, let me just finish saying that, uh, well, he studied, uh, he got his um, bachelor's in government from uh, Harvard College, and then he got his MBA also from Harvard Business School, where he was uh, named uh, Baker Scholar. And, um, and again, thank you very much, uh, Whitney, for joining us today. And Thank you. All right, I'll, I'll take Thanks. it. I'll take it from here. As I've been scrolling through the video snippets, I notice uh, some of you um, use the favorite background of being in outer space or in San Francisco. Um, this one here happens to be my favorite. This is uh, Trechime de Lavaredo um, in the Dolomites. Um, uh, when you know I'm a thousand feet up on a wall here taking a picture, so this is one of my favorites. Um, and whenever I have some deep conversation, uh, I like this one. See, I'm going to go into the weeds with you. Um, so with that little bit of humor, I'm going to switch it back um, and uh, start in here. But uh, 
uh, it's fun. Aren't these Zoom calls that you can make them sort of fun if you want? So, um, Whitney, if you allow me, one yes. of the things that we did in the previous session is that people were also um, making comments in the chat that I was moderating in the background. Yes. You don't need to follow them, but with this, maybe questions will come up and things. So. Yes. Yeah, okay, why don't we do that? Why don't you, why, yeah, why don't you do that, Mark? Um, I'm, yeah. I'll give a little bit of an intro. Um, Excellent. And then uh, why don't students just uh, start posting in the chat and you can, uh, instead of me trying to read them, why don't you uh, moderate them and you follow them, Mark, and you can ask me the questions. How's that? Sure. Let, let's do um, that. Uh, and if they want to ask directly, they can also do it. Great. Great. Um, Thanks. So, um, so a little bit of background. Uh, I grew up all over the world. My parents uh, met and married in the Peace Corps in 1962. I spent half my childhood in Tanzania and Nicaragua. Um, first school I ever went to was age five in Morogoro, Tanzania. Um, so uh, I lived in California twice. Um, my dad got his doctorate at Stanford, uh, where my sister attended later. Um, I lived in Western Massachusetts, Boston, met my wife there, and she's from New York. So guess where we ended up moving? So I've lived in New York the second half of my life. Um, and um, I, I came late to the investing world. You all are lucky um, learning about investing uh, at, 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 at this level. Even when I went to Harvard Business School, um, I had no interest in investing. Warren Buffett came to speak on campus and I didn't even go hear him speak. I didn't know who he was. Um, that's how clueless I was. Uh, I was a business person and I fancied myself I was gonna start or run an entrepreneurial business. Um, it was only after business school. And, and well, part of the reason I was never an investor is, is because I never had any money. My parents were teachers. Uh, we weren't poor, uh, but we lived very modestly and uh, certainly never invested in any stocks. My parents never owned a stock in their entire lives. Um, and I didn't even know what a stock was. So, um, so it's sort of strange that in the late 90s, for the first time in my life, my wife, I got married, she was working as a lawyer. Um, we, were, we didn't have any children at the time um, and we were living in her grandparents' apartment in New York. So we had a very low cost of living. We were both earning in income. And so we paid off my business school debts and so I had, I still remember having the first $10,000 in my bank account of my entire life. I was almost 30 years old. Um, and so I went to my friend, Bill Ackman of the famous hedge fund manager who grew up in the exact opposite environment. He was buying stocks when he was a teenager, back when we became friends at Harvard. And uh, he said, uh, I said, what should I do with my $10,000? And he's like, well, you should buy stocks with it. But to learn how to do that, go read all of Warren Buffett's annual letters. And so that's what I did. And, you know, Warren Buffett resonated with me. The idea of buying dollar bills for 50 cents uh, was, was completely consistent with um, everything I had grown up with. So um, I started uh, I, investing on my own in the late 90s was just like the late 2000s, you know, 2020s, up to the, up up till the recent coronavirus crisis, which is, you know, every stock I picked went up, and the more risky the stock I bought, the more it went up. Um, and so I learned a lot of the wrong lessons in the late stages of a bull market, just like a lot of young people learned a lot of the wrong lessons over the past 10 years, um, you know, and started doing silly things like speculating in Bitcoin and that kind of thing. So. Um, I know what it's like because I used to be one of those foolish speculators um, in my youth. Uh, but fortunately, I had good mentors. I sat in on Joel Greenblatt's class at Columbia. Um, Bill Ackman was a mentor. I started going out to the Berkshire annual meetings. The biggest influences on me have been Buffett and Munger as an investor. And so I started my own little hedge fund with a million dollars out of my bedroom. Uh, over the next dozen years, I beat the market 11 out of 12 years. From 1999 to 2010, I navigated through the collapse of the internet bubble, the housing bubble. I predicted both of them publicly. Um, and I was riding high at running $200 million. Um, and, you know, sky's the limit. Uh, you know, private jet and Hamptons estate uh, beckoned. And, uh, and then I lost it all. Um, I failed to see the long bull market over the last 10 years. I sat there with a lot of cash and a short book. Um, and so I underperformed the market for seven years in a row and that got, uh, I wasn't losing money. I was just sort of flat in a long bull market when stocks were going up 15, 20% a year. And that was very frustrating. I was very, I was a very public figure. I had investors who, you know, had, were accustomed to me 
doing better than just a plain old S&P 500 index fund, which I had beaten regularly in my early career. And so after seven years of frustration, I pulled the plug um, and I took a year off. I was teaching investing seminars, some of them via Zoom, just like this. Um, and um, I got into the investment newsletter business, which I really love. Basically, I do exactly what I did as a hedge fund manager, which is I try and find one good investment idea a month, maybe two. The only difference is, is instead of managing other people's money, and when I find a good idea, investing in it on their behalf, with their money, with my hedge fund, instead, they manage their own money, and I send them a write-up. Um, recommending a particular stock this month and then they can make the decision whether it's right for them and so I'm an investment advisor not an investment manager today so that's what I do now so let me finish my comments by just talking uh, the reports I sent out to you is is you know almost all the reports I send to my investors are focused on a stock recommendation and then maybe an update on some of the previous ones the portfolio update that would be a typical monthly newsletter that I send um, about a month ago or a month and a half ago, though, stock picking stopped mattering. The only thing that mattered was the coronavirus and the news around the coronavirus and the news flow and so forth. So I started spending enormous amounts of time um, studying this virus. And initially, I had it completely wrong. I thought that it was just a slightly, uh, a slightly different variation of the seasonal flu and that people were making a mountain out of a molehill and uh, the stock market was was overreacting down 10 or 15 percent um, but thankfully friends like bill ackman told me whitney you're totally wrong on this you need to go do more work i did do more work and i got uh, i quickly turned around realized my mistake and since then um i've pretty well nailed it um in that this is this is going to be really serious um, but we're going to get through it. And I, in fact, made a big, big call when the market in the U.S. was down a little over 30 percent from its peak uh, on March 23rd was the day we hit the intraday bottom here in, uh, with the S&P 500. Um, I did a big webinar. I taped it that day. It aired the next night. And I said, um, I don't see the end, but I see the beginning of the end. And I don't think other investors are seeing that beginning of the end. And uh, I laid out the analysis in a two hour webinar, which is captured in the reports that I sent you. And I, you know, I pounded the table and I said, I think this is the best time to be buying stocks since 2008, 2009, since the global financial crisis. Um, I don't think I'll ever see a better time in my lifetime than that particular period. But um, what happened two and a half weeks ago was maybe half as good, but that's still pretty good in terms of putting money to work at attractive prices. So, um, so I continue to think that the coronavirus is gonna be a big driver, but it's now becoming clear um, from the data I'm seeing in Spain, e even in the worst hit areas now, which, I, which are clearly New York City. It's not even the United States, it's just New York City. Um, uh, and New York State and, and maybe a little bit of New Jersey, but really the epicenter of the crisis now is New York City, Spain, and Italy. And all three of those countries, um, um, uh, now some other countries may be flaring up, like uh, I happen to have on my screen, so I'm gonna do a screen share right now, and I'll show you the UK data, um, and Boris Johnson um, completely misread the situation and thought they could get through with herd immunity. So here are a couple of the charts that I'm tracking for a dozen different countries. And the blue bar shows the number of people testing positive cumulatively. But the number you really want to focus on is each day, how many people are testing positive? What's happening there? And are you seeing a plateau? So this is the top chart here is, positive, is cases, i.e. positive tests. And you can see that the number was rising very fast. And they you know, had a big spike here uh, back you know, four or five days ago, but overall seems to be plateauing in the last three days are down, which is a good sign. And then the deaths, which is the next chart down are a lagging indicator, because keep in mind, anyone who's dying probably got infected four to six weeks earlier, right? So even if you have the disease completely under control, um, you'll the deaths are going to keep going up at least for a week or two 
because those are people who got infected when you didn't have the disease under control, right? So very, very important thing to understand, whereas deaths create headlines in the media, but they're actually the least relevant metric for tracking whether you've got the disease under control. Um, there you want to be looking at new infections, which you can sometimes, like the South Koreans and others, can do because they test broadly. But at the very least, the next metric you would want to look at is new cases, um, people testing positive. Um, so there's the first chart I just showed you was cases. This is number of deaths. And you can see, again, after rising rapidly, the last three days in the UK uh, have been good. And then so this chart combines the top two charts per day. The blue bars are number of new cases per day. The red line is number of deaths per day. And again, you can see there was a big spike four days ago, but now the last three days have started to come down. So um, you guys, I'm sure, are following the Spain data, but let me just flip over there. And you guys are looking a lot better. You guys are much further along the curve. The no overall number of cases are still rising, but you've had now about a week and a half. Uh, you had about a week of plateau here, and then uh, almost, it looks like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. You've had almost two weeks of declining cases per day, declining deaths per day. Um, and so you guys are clearly over the hump in Spain. Your social distancing uh, and lockdown is working. And so obviously it's, it's tragic that you still have 550 people dying every day, but that's a heck of a lot better than a thousand people dying a day, you know, 10 days ago, right? So, um, so that would be Spain. Um, and let me see if I can find, here's Italy. And Italy similarly here um, is, is sort of, this is cases and deaths per day. Let me see if I can um, expand the size of this chart here. Hold on just a second. So that chart right there, again, you can see Italy, it's not dropping as fast as you would like to see. Um, it's, it's like your, you can see your curve is curving, is, is tipping further and, and declining more steeply. Um, Italy is still struggling up, up there in Northern Italy. Um, so let me just show you, since I've now shown you three European countries, let me show you my hometown and why US stocks are up. Um, and then maybe we can stop and take some questions in a minute. So this chart here is tracking the blue line and the red line are tests ordered and test positive. Um, but the deaths, the deaths number is a trailing number and you can see that that was rising. But just in the past couple of days, there's uh, been some decline. Now the New York data is weird. You'll notice it's maybe hard to tell here, but if you look at the axis here, the latest data point is four days ago. And the reason is, is when New York reports the data, and by the way, this is New York City, just the city, um, that um, the data, and the initial data reported this morning has data from yesterday, but the data is no good because it takes three or four days for the data to arrive. So with New York, this chart doesn't look super great. It only shows a day or two days of declines. But in fact, if you look at the trend line of the most recent three days, the trend line is down, but we can't chart it yet just because the data has not been finalized. Um, so um, there are other metrics here. This is tests and, and deaths. The other thing we track in New York, which is really critical, is hospitalizations, and particularly how many ICU beds, intensive care unit beds, are being used because when you run out of ICU beds and your hospitals get overwhelmed, that's where your mortality rate spikes up, which is what happened in Italy in particular, um, where Italy had the highest mortality rate by far of any country in the world. Um, though I think Spain is pretty high as well. Um, so I'm not sure, I haven't followed Spain as closely. It hasn't gotten as much press here in the United States, but um, I suspect some of your hospitals got overwhelmed as well. And when you have elderly people with lungs that are collapsing, you've got to get them on a ventilator, or they're going to die. Uh, so um, with that, why don't um, uh, my, I'll just finish with 30 seconds just on big picture is um, I think I, and I think it is now the consensus view, it was not the consensus view when I sent that report out two weeks ago, that we can now, we now know that even in the worst hit areas, we know what works, 
we know how to get the disease under control, um, and we know we're going to win the battle. Um, and new treatments are being developed. We'll have a vaccine within 12 to 18 months, um, I'm pretty sure. So that's the good news. Um, the bad news is um, that the only way we figured out how to win is to do an extreme economic shutdown, which has resulted in 17 million Americans filing for unemployment in the last three weeks. Um, and that's really hitting all of us very hard in an economic way, not to mention completely disrupting all of our lives. And so the question, the real question now has shifted from, can we win the battle? We now know yes is the answer. The question now is, is how quickly can we get back to work and, and how quickly can our economies start up again? Um, are we going to shape, see a V-shaped recovery or are we going to, is it gonna be much worse and we're gonna be stagnant for a while before recovering? My personal view is, is that at least in the United States, we're the wealthiest country in the world, we're the world's reserve currency, we can borrow an unlimited amount of money at, at no cost, basically. Um, that the Trump administration will do, because Trump wants to be reelected in November, that the Trump administration will do anything and everything to flood the economy with money um, and try and get stock prices up because Trump, that's the metric that Trump follows. Um, and uh, and I, think, uh, I think he will, you know, if you flood an economy with enough money and you just borrow enough money, well, you may have a long-term debt problem to solve like Italy and Spain do. The U.S. doesn't really have nearly as much a problem currently, but Trump, Trump does not care one iota about debt. This is a guy who ran casinos. This is a guy who went bankrupt five times. But in the short term, he just wants to get reelected. So that makes me bullish on U.S. stocks. That's the main reason I'm bullish is because I think we're going to beat the coronavirus and because I think our economy is going to come back. Um, but uh, I can't discount the political uh, dynamics at work here as well. So with that, Mark, happy to answer mm -hmm. any questions. And by the Actually, way, do, there are a number do, of we have till, here. do we have till 9.15? Is that our timing? Yeah, 9.30 9 actually, if you want. Okay, That's the, the, perfect. Yeah. Um, so yes, we have a number of questions actually. Um, and actually, uh, one of them has to do with the data that you have presented. There is always the issue about how many people get tested, you know? And, yes. and to what extent, I mean, obviously that has an impact also on the kind of the, the shape that you would see here on the evolution, yes. right? Because maybe yes. there are more tests being done with time or in other, in some countries there are more tests being done than in others. Right. And so that was one of the issues uh, commented here. Yeah, well, let me, let me comment on it because look, if you want your number of cases to go down, that's simple, just stop testing, right? Uh, that's the only way a case appears. Um, of course, that's the exact wrong thing to do. Um, in fact, every single country that has gotten a hold uh, uh, of this crisis has done widespread testing. Um, and the key is, is you don't just wanna test people with symptoms, you need to test everyone because a lot of people have the virus and are spreading it, but don't have symptoms. And you need to identify those people, even though they feel fine, right? So it's an absolute disgrace on the part of your government, our government, Italy's government, all these countries where we did not learn the lessons of earlier epidemics, then look at what Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, um, China, um, and of course, South Korea, where testing is everywhere. And here's the thing, once, imagine there were a test, and by the way, I just took a little test yesterday. This right here is an antibody test, which tests, doesn't test whether you currently have the virus, but it tests whether you might have had it in the past. And so it's like a pregnancy test. And that little bar you see here for me shows that I do not have the antibody because I haven't gotten the coronavirus, knock on wood. But just last night, I biked 24 miles all over New York City to five people who had the coronavirus, who, who had a confirmed positive test, they've now recovered, to give them the antibody test. And this test was, it's, a, it's an experimental developmental test um, that um, has not been FDA approved, uh, but there are a bunch, there are dozens of companies in the United States that are developing these little $2 tests that anyone can just do at home. All you do is you prick your finger, you put a little bit of blood right here uh, in that little thing, you add three drops of reagent and you just wait five minutes and it tells you whether you have antibodies. 
So I think tests like this are going to be a game changer because they'll tell people who's immune, who's got the antibodies, right? That's really important. And then separately, there's a separate kind of test, which is the one where they put the cotton swab up your nose, which tells you whether you are currently infected. Imagine if tomorrow, everyone in the United States, there was some app on your phone where you could just point it at your face and it would tell you if you're, have the, if you're carrying, right? At that point, you could immediately restart your economy because everyone who, who's carrying the disease would have to stay home and self-quarantine because it goes away in a couple of weeks, right? And everybody else could go back to work. So let me tell you the story of a little town called Vaux, Italy. It's only got 3,000 people. And the very first death in Italy at the end of February, February 23rd, was in Vaux. And some researchers, I think it was the University of Milan, went up to Vaux. And because it's only 3,000 people in the town, they tested every single person in the town. And here's what they found. 89 people, 2.7% of the population, tested positive. And here's where things get really interesting. Only half the people knew it. The other half of the people were asymptomatic. They felt fine. So without the test, they would have never known and they would have gone out there and spread it around, right? So what did Vaux do? Vaux did not hospitalize all 89 people because now you're exposing them to your medical professionals um, and to each other and visitors, right? Instead, they sent them home and they told them, you have this dangerous virus, you need to isolate at home and not see anybody else, not even your family. So then two weeks later, a mere two weeks later, and by the way, this little town is in the absolute epicenter hot zone of where everybody's dying in Italy, okay? In two weeks, guess how many people tested? And then they tested all 3,000 people again two weeks later. The answer is, is 13 people had it. They went from 2.7% to 0.4% of their population having the coronavirus in two weeks because, you know, because the people who had it didn't infect anyone new or almost no one and the disease passed. It's like, for most people, it's like the common cold, right? So that's the answer. The answer is, is we need widespread testing so that the people who have it can, can do what they need to do and everybody else can go back to their normal lives, right? And, and uh, so I think we're gonna get there, but in the meantime, um, so, so this is why testing is so important and it's so important that we ramp up testing uh, to, a big, to a big degree and not just test the people who are sick. Okay, there are many questions here. Let me just, maybe people ask directly. So for example, we have Rafael da Silva. Rafael. Do you need to unmute him or does he unmute himself? No, he can unmute himself. Sorry, I, my question was related to the test. He, he, the point is in, in several countries, uh, the, there is a shortage of those tests. So nowadays, the number of new cases reported can be completely misleading. For example, here in Spain, they are not testing everybody. Uh, I, I'm from Brazil. I'm talking with people there that have all the symptoms. They go to the hospital and yeah. they cannot test because of this shortage. So the data that we see can be completely misleading in terms of new cases. And to have a forecast, yes. the new cases are really important, right? Yes, you're absolutely right. And that's why you need to follow not just cases, but you need to follow hospitalizations and you need to follow deaths, okay? Because those numbers are accurate. If someone gets really sick that they need to go to a hospital, um, that is actually the key metric as to whether your healthcare system gets overwhelmed. And then of course, um, whether your healthcare system um, uh, is effective at treating people, um, and to some extent, the demographics of your population, and there are many other factors that determine the mortality rate. So obviously, look, the number of people getting sick, I don't care at all, um, uh, if you think about it, because it, as long as people don't have to go to the hospital and die, that's the number, that's what matters, right? That's what overwhelms your system, and that's what panics people, rightly so, um, and shuts down your country. So you're absolutely right. Um, we do track cases, but we, you also have to validate the cases data to see, because it could be very misleading. And in some countries it is misleading. You got to track the hospitalizations uh, and the deaths. There was another question here and Shul was asking, 
whether um, do you think that in these times it, it's better to invest just in index funds or, or really you can do stock picking as you're suggesting? Yeah, I, mean, um, I sent you reports, um, three reports uh, that I did for my subscribers. We released the first report publicly, which is just making the case for why we see the light at the end of the tunnel for the getting through this coronavirus. And that's proven extremely prescient. Then the second report and the third report, which we only sent to our paying subscribers, the second report makes the case that, okay, if report number one is right, then here's why we think it's a great time to buy stocks. Um, because it doesn't necessarily follow if um, just because we get a handle on the coronavirus, the stocks are a buy, it depends on what expectations are built into stocks. So that there we made the case to just buy stocks. And then the third report is, we're our 10 favorite stocks, right? Um, so that's the kind of stuff that we reserve only for our paying subscribers and lovely students like you that we occasionally share with because we like to teach students, right? So it was a three-part argument, um, and, and, uh, but, but really the most important part was part one. If you got part one right, you could have bought any stock two and a half weeks ago and you're doing well, right? So in my particular case, um, I, as an investment newsletter publisher, cannot buy any stock that I recommend to my readers because it creates a conflict of interest. You know, do I buy it before I recommend it to them or after I recommend it to them? Uh, and if I decide to sell, can I sell before? Or do I have to wait, right? You know what I'm saying? It just creates conflicts of interest. So the, my, the favorite stocks that I would love to buy, I cannot buy because those are the ones I'm recommending to my readers. So the simple answer is, is, um, is I'll tell you what I did and what my financial picture looked like, which is when I closed my hedge funds two and a half years ago, I took, I distributed cash to all of my investors, including myself. I sold all my stocks and I closed the fund, right? So everybody got a big cash distribution and I have been sitting on that cash, which represents, you know, virtually all of my net worth was in my hedge fund. So other than the value of this apartment right here, I have no other assets other than cash and investments, right? So I don't own, I, I own one piece of real estate and that's it. Um, I don't do private equity investing. I don't do venture capital investing other than a couple little tiny things that, are, that don't make any difference, right? So um, as of uh, a month and a half ago, so for the last two years, I've just been sitting on a huge pile of cash, like 85% of all of my retirement savings, et cetera, not counting the value of my apartment, um, which is probably half my net worth. Um, I was just sitting in cash. And I felt like the biggest jerk because, you know, stocks were up 31% last year. And so I was here sitting in cash. And well, I don't feel like such a jerk anymore. Um, you know, I just didn't like the market very much. Um, and I was worried about if I bought any stocks, um, that maybe I'd, I'd want to recommend them someday in the future to one of my readers. So long and short of it is, is part of it was just inertia. I just didn't like the market. I just didn't have a good gut. I had, I had no clue about the coronavirus or anything like that, but I was sitting on 85% cash. So as the market went down, this was the opportunity I was waiting for. So I put more and more of my cash to work. Um, basically, every time the market had a big puke out day, Every time the market was down 5% or something on a day, that's the day I would add 3 4 5% exposure. And we've had a lot of big puke out days over the last couple of months. Um, and so I probably started buying when the market was down 12%. So, you know, I bought down 12, down 18, down 22, down 26, down 34. The market at its bottom was down 34% peak to trough here in the United States, but only for a couple hours. And then it's rallied by 25% in the last two and a half weeks. This is the S&P 500. Many stocks have doubled and tripled the most beaten down stocks, right? So, um, so the vast majority of my money, I just put into the S&P 500 index. I average cost it. I, I did average dollar cost averaging in. And today I've gone from 15% stocks to 71% stocks um, because I'm a 53 year old guy. I expect to live another 40 years. Um, I'm very healthy and assuming I don't fall off a mountain or something, I'm gonna live a long time. And this is my, uh, these are my IRA and 401k, my tax deferred retirement funds. So that money, I'm not, I'm not gonna need that money. I have an income to support myself. So this is pure, this isn't 10 year money. This is 40 year money. 
there's, there's, it shouldn't be sitting in cash. It should just be in stocks and probably just blue chip, you know, S&P 500 index kind of stocks. So this was this past month and a half was the opportunity for me to get my asset allocation correct. So you'll notice though, I'm not at 100%, which is I would be perfectly happy being at 100%. That's actually the most logical place for me to be um, with my long-term retirement money. But you know what, I'm still keeping some dry powder. Um, I, I don't know whether stocks are gonna retrace through their lows of two and a half weeks ago. That would require a 21% decline in the market from today. Um, I think the odds of that are maybe 30%. In other words, I think we set the year's low in the US market two and a half weeks ago. Um, but I'm not certain of it. And I wanna keep some dry powder to take advantage of it because I think corporate earnings are gonna be horrific for the next six months. Um, so, so that's what I'm doing personally. And I think just buying a, a broad index fund is the best option for most people. Now look, I went out and I bought some bank stocks and I speculated with a few airline stocks and I bought one uh, retailer, a high growth retailer called Florin Decor, you know? Um, you know, I bought, I, I bought some stocks with maybe 10% of my capital, but of the 70% that I have invested, 55 to 60% of it is just the S&P 500 index, nothing more. And then maybe I got another 10 plus percent in a handful, of, sort of a basket of stocks. Very good. There is another question here by Ram, Ram Bisani. Hi, sorry, just had a follow-on question to that um, regarding the, the expensiveness of the S&P index. Uh, until the sell-off, it was, it was prob it's probably been the most expensive it has ever been. And after the sell-off, it looked like it was trading around this median, um, and now we've had this 20% bull rally. Would you yeah. say it's time to take a bit of money off the table and, and, and then wait till the next down leg because people think it's a relief rally? Uh, yeah. for, fair enough, in the short term, Trump might be pushing up the market, but in the medium term, as we saw during the financial crisis, it started off as a credit crisis, but then this, this two months that no com companies have not really been um, earning any money. Yeah, um, you're breaking it's up good. a little bit there. Um, um, but, what do you make of that I, in, in terms of the meeting? Yeah, um, I, I think I'm pretty sure I got the gist of your question. So let me make the case that one of my colleagues uh, who writes for my publication, uh, it's not just me, there are three of us now. Here's what she argues. She said, look, for example, I follow hotels, Hilton, Marriott, the big international hotel groups. And she's like, look, for most of my life, they traded between 10 and 15 times EBITDA, and back in 08, they got down to eight times EBITDA, which was a generational opportunity to buy anything, right? Um, and she said, over the past year, prior to the coronavirus crisis, they, at the high end, they traded at 15 times EBITDA, and then they went up and they just decided to trade at 20 times EBITDA. The valuations just got at the very high end, right? And she's like, okay, now that they're down by 25%, they're back to 15 times EBITDA, which is the high end of the historical range. And I'm supposed to get all excited about that. Um, they're nowhere near, they're nowhere, nothing. They're still double the valuation they were back in 08, right? Um, and so in the retail consumer space, you know, where she operates in the hotels, that kind of thing, that's sort of what she's seeing. So she did not put as much money to work as I did. Um, now, uh, and, and look, I can't discount that argument. You know, stocks could get cheaper. On the other hand, keep in mind that, um, um, you know, back in those times, we're now operating in a zero interest percent uh, environment. We're operating with $2 trillion of fiscal stimulus and $5 trillion of monetary stimulus from the Fed. Um, and, you know, bonds are yielding zero or negative, right? So, there's still 70 trillion of, of investment capital sloshing around the world um, that's now being levered up, you know, with governments uh, pouring money in, and that money's got to go somewhere. And I don't think uh, bonds are offering anything right now. So maybe it's a little bit cynical, um, but you could see the mother of all relief rallies here. So I'm not taking any money off the table, but keep in mind, I'm still underinvested my target would be to be up to 85 to 90% invested. And right now I'm 71%. Uh, 
Um, so whether you take money off the table, I suppose sort of depends on whether you're all in. Like if I had 100% of my money invested two and a half weeks ago, and I had this big 25% rally, yeah, I might take off 10% um, and have 10% dry powder. If I didn't have any dry powder, yeah, yeah, I might take a little off the table. Given that I've got, I still consider myself to have loads of dry powder with 29% right now. Um, I'm, I'm not selling because look, I'm taking a long-term view. Okay. The question I'm asking myself is, is 20 to 40 years from now, will I be happy own, that I owned the S&P 500 at today's prices? And the fact that it might go down another 20, 25% and retrace back to its lows is absolutely irrelevant in, when I look at a 20 to 40 year horizon. It just doesn't matter. Um, so, so I try not to get hung up with sort of short-term short -term thinking because I'm fortunate, I guess, in, in being able to think very, very long-term. The only other thing I will say to your point is, is there's no way on earth stocks were at all-time highs. Um, like I've seen the valuation metrics, I've seen the arguments, but I'm just telling you, the, those are based on the major market indices. And I can name I can name the major stocks that comprise the bulk of those indices. So let's just go through the top 10 stocks in the S&P 500, okay? You have the five big tech stocks who are the five largest. And this is the US, right? Okay, so you got Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Alphabet, and um, um, Microsoft that are all rotating as the largest, right? Then you got Berkshire Hathaway's number six. And then off the top of my head, you have Visa, um, uh, you got um, Johnson & Johnson, um, you got JP Morgan Chase, you got your largest banks. So I've now named nine of the top 10 uh, companies. Even a, a month, two months ago, at the, before the coronavirus, when stocks were at all time highs, there's not a single one of those stocks I would short. And in fact, I was long many of them, okay? So in other words, you know, you, it's, it's easy to make these big, big, look at these big prognostications. And the thing is, is the problem is, is those, those big numbers are being faked out by Amazon. I'm telling you, Amazon is worth a trillion dollars and it's probably worth $2 trillion, um, but it has no current earnings. So when you take, uh, when you plug Amazon in to a PE multiple for the S&P 500, and that's the single largest component, or maybe in the top two or three, um, it throws your calculations off and it gives you a bad number. So I'm not saying the market was cheap at all. It was at the high end of historical valuation ranges, but it was nothing like the peak of the internet bubble back in 2000 or the peak of the housing bubble um, where things just really, really got stupid. Um, I actually think stocks were roughly appropriately priced two months ago, given a fairly benign environment, low interest rates, a booming US economy, right? And then this coronavirus just came, was a black swan that came out of nowhere. Um, uh, so uh, so I, I have a little bit, that makes me a little bit more bullish. So now if we get through this coronavirus, you're gonna have the world's easiest year over year comps for the next year, okay? You've got, you've got even lower interest rates, making bonds even less attractive You've got $6 trillion, US GDP is $18 trillion a year. You have one third of US GDP that just got injected into the economy in a week, right? Um, uh, you, you know, things, uh, things could go crazy to the upside. We have a question here from Joaquino. Uh... Yes, so um, basically uh, we've seen in the past, uh, weeks uh, investors trying to work on the fundamentals and screening out between bad and good quality stocks and then all of the sudden the Fed came in and bump in 2.3 trillion in the market shot right. around between it's, it's really more than double that if you yeah. look at the various yeah, leverage now to, on the various to lending five trillion. programs yeah. yeah I'm talking about last week measure of pumping up 2.3 trillion in the market yeah. and shopping it around uh, corporate to high yield and so turning upside down uh, all the uh, fundamental valuations. I feel that there is a shift that the, should be a, a shift between fundamental driven to more uh, getting ahead of the what would be the next central bank move 
because they're they're completely uh, turning upside down what sort of valuation what's your take on this let me um for m almost my entire career i paid no attention to any of this kind of thing and all i did was just look at s industries and companies and try and find good companies that i thought i could buy at a reasonable price right um in uh, since becoming an investment newsletter publisher and i'm not down in the weeds and taking a couple years off and figuring out what was my big mistake that cost me a fabulous business i lost a fabulous business that i had built because I had these blinders on and I was just too dogmatic. Um, and one of the ways that I was dogmatic is, is that I viewed myself as a value investor. And I would encourage you to view, view yourself the same way I view myself today, which is I am a make money investor. Okay. Um, and if I think, so one of the things I try and think about now is, is not just what, how I view the world, which is purely rationally and analytically, I try to think about how other investors I think are going to view the world. So the debate I'm having with my friend who thinks stocks are going to retrace is she's like, Whitney, corporate earnings are going to be terrible in the second quarter. And I think they're going to be terrible in the third quarter. And I said, I don't care. I think every company in the world is going to get a pass for this entire year from investors. And then come the fourth quarter, investors are going to start looking out to 2021 and by then, we will have the coronavirus under control. Corporate earnings will start to be rebounding. So even if you get more of a U-shaped, not a V-shaped recovery, right? Um, looking out to 2021, for most companies, and by the way, some companies are never coming back. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute. Like, I think cruise, line, cruise lines are done. I don't think people, I, I don't think anybody, even with a vaccine out there, like my, my in-laws took our whole entire family on an Alaska cruise on a big cruise ship. Um, uh, I don't think they'll ever do that again. Um, uh, so I, I'm not saying every cruise liner in the world is mothballed. You'll always have niche cruises up to Antarctica and the drunken cruises from Helsinki to St. Petersburg to Riga or whatever, those kind of cruises, those niche things will exist. But I think the days of these enormous boats where 4,000 people are just packed on like sardines, I, I, I don't think that recovers. So what I'm talking though here is that I'm talking about the S&P 500, okay? I'm just talking about corporate America. I think by the time you get to the fourth quarter, um, everyone, investors are always forward looking. Um, and uh, I think what investors are gonna be looking at is, is unbelievably easy comps year over year. So first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter, their companies are gonna be reporting massive revenue gains, massive profit gains off the depressed levels of this year. Then you throw in all of the stimulus still sloshing around uh, in the economy um, and ultra low interest rates and all. And so I think even though the current fundamentals, I assume they're gonna be terrible for the rest of this year, I do not think that that necessarily translates into uh, uh, depressed stock prices. I think it could almost, I think stock prices could rip. So look, I'm not, I'm still sitting on 29% cash, right? So I'm hedging my bets. Like I've taken my exposure up a lot. I'm going to do great if stocks rip. I've got plenty of dry powder if stocks don't because there's a very wide range of outcomes here. So to some extent, I would encourage you to just be humble be re recognized that there's a very wide range of outcomes. And look, two and a half weeks ago, I thought the wide range of outcomes was heavily tilted towards stocks going up and co conceivably very quickly because there was just blood in the streets and in, 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 from an investment perspective, maybe that's not the, or not the right analogy to use during this pandemic, but you understand what I'm saying. Like it was the level of fear um, and the negativity and the headlines, um, you know, one of my friends called it coronavirus porn. You know, every, if it, you know, in the media business, there's the saying, if it bleeds, it leads, right? In other words, you want to sell newspapers, you want to get clicks, you want to get viewers, then focus on the most dramatic stories of human suffering, right? Well, that's the coronavirus writ large, right? So that's what I was seeing two and a half weeks ago. With stocks up 25%, I think the probability curve has now shifted back toward the middle where you, you just got a wide range of outcomes. I, I do think though, 
if you were to buy uh, a S&P 500 index or a broad European or global index, I feel pretty good that one year from now, you'll be happy, even if, even if it goes down 20% between now and then uh, at some point. Going back here to questions on um, more on valuation, maybe a little bit more technical if you want. There is a question here about, uh, from Ram about uh, what red flags do you look for to avoid value traps? Because you mentioned before that one of the things is that, look, this is not just anymore about fundamentals. I mean, here you have to take into consideration where the capital is moving, what, you know, many other things that, that have nothing to do with the micro analysis of, of stocks. Yeah. And so um, do we have yeah. to avoid certain stocks that maybe they are small, they are not very liquid, they are, and they always look right. like an opportunity, right? Right. Um, well, look, if a stock's going to go down, just don't buy it, duh. Um, <laughs> so, um, no, but in all seriousness, um, how do you avoid value traps is the hardest thing, particularly for a value investor. And a value trap, they come in two different flavors, but in both cases, the stocks generally look statistically cheap. It's usually beaten up. There's usually a lot of negativity and you buy it. And if you're lucky, if it is a value trap, you it's flat you know you just don't make any money when the market goes up and you trail the market of course the worst kind of value trap is is that it keeps going down um and again i have a lot a lot a lot of experience both with you know it's basically if you think about it a value trap is a turnaround bet but that never turns around right um and so there's no quick and easy answer other than you just got to do your analysis correct and be certain that something's going to turn around. But let me be clear. Some people get drawn into value traps, but they don't think it's going to turn around. They just think it's too cheap. They acknowledge that it's a declining business with all these headwinds, but hey, it's trading at three times EBITDA. So, you know, how can I lose money? Well, the answer is, is if EBITDA keeps going down and it keeps trading at three times EBITDA, the stock is going to go down directly in line with the decline in EBITDA if the multiple doesn't change, right? Um, so that's how you lose money. So the one thing I would really caution is, is my view is, is stocks follow earnings, okay? Now, over short periods of time, they can diverge from earnings, but over time, stocks follow earnings. So if you're buying a company that's a check printer or a paging company or something like that, um, those earnings are just going to go down and down and down and down. And I would argue it doesn't matter what price you buy that stock at, you're going to lose money. The converse thing, which was very hard for me to understand as a value investor, one of my great failures was failing to appreciate that it almost doesn't matter how much you pay for a stock if its earnings are going to grow a lot. So one of my colleagues, Enrique Abeda, who publishes newsletters under my brand, he's like, Whitney, all I try and do is I don't care about valuation. All I try and do is buy stocks that currently have a dollar a share of earnings and three to five years from now are gonna have $5 a share of earnings. Earnings are gonna go up five times. And he said, I don't care what the valuation is today. If I'm right that earnings go up 5X, that stock's going up and it's going up a lot. It might, not, it, it might not go up 5X, it might go up 3X, but I'm still happy. But you know what? More often than not, the valuation multiple that seemed high today if a stock's earnings go up five times, that valuation multiple is probably going to expand. So I might make 10 times my money on the stock, right? And he said, what do I look to short? I look to short companies that currently have $5 a share of earnings and the earnings are going to a dollar. And he said, I don't care if it's trading at one times earnings. If earnings are five bucks and earnings go to a dollar, that stock is going down. So the point here is, is, um, is I used to focus really heavily as a value investor, I focused on valuation and I had it absolutely backwards. Okay, as, as an investor, you should focus on business quality and where earnings are going to go. And then only then make sure you're not paying too high a price. Like for example, this company we're on right now, we are on a Zoom call. Okay, Zoom is a great company. This is an incredible piece of technology. It's so much better than uh, Cisco's WebEx and Skype and so forth, right? Everybody uses Zoom. I used it extensively. It's so reasonably priced, fabulous company. You ought to know right now, let me, let me just pull it up here just to, just to check it, what the latest number is. The last time I looked, it was trading at 60 times revenue. Not, not earnings, revenue. Um, 
So you, you don't, I mean, just to say, oh, Zoom's a great company and earnings are going to grow, so I'm going to buy it. Well, not when it's trading. It, it's, it's trading today. Oh, oh, it's down to 59.6 times revenue. So just to be clear what that means, this company has $623 million of revenue. And right now, as we speak, has a $37.9 billion market cap. That's what 59.6 times revenue means. So, boy, I just think it's hard to make money buying stocks trading at 60, 60, uh, 60 times revenue. That's hard. Um, there's just so much risk there because look, Cisco isn't standing still. They're going to develop a, a, you know, I don't, I don't see anything patented here. Like it's, it's a really good company, and I don't, I would not recommend shorting the stock, even though the valuation is extreme, because you do not want to get short something where earnings and revenue are going to grow at a high rate for a long period of time, right? Uh, again, the inverse of a value trap going long is getting destroyed on the short side, and where my short sellers and where I have gotten destroyed on the short side is is getting in the way of a growth story because the valuation looked high. That is an absolutely deadly and stupid thing to do on the short side. And in fact, you should look for some of those stories to mix up your long portfolio. So look, I, one of my recommendations is Altria, the cigarette company. It's yielding 8%, it trades at eight, eight or nine times earnings today. It's a classic big cap value stock today, right? But I also try and balance out my portfolio and recommend Amazon, which I think is gonna be a big winner from this coronavirus crisis in the same way Alibaba was a huge winner from the SARS epidemic years ago in China, because it's shifting, it's getting, the people who were not ordering a lot online are now ordering a lot more online because they've been quarantined here in the US. Um, and keep in mind, only 15% of US retail sales are online. Amazon owns about half of that. So do I think Amazon has room? Do I think there's room to grow, I don't think Amazon's gonna take more than 50% market share. They don't, in fact, I don't think they want to because they would run into antitrust issues, okay? But do I think that five years from now and 10 years from now and 15 years from now and 20 years from now, do I think more than 15% of US purchasing will be online? You bet. It's 100% certain in my opinion. And I think this, uh, the, this coronavirus crisis is going to be a step function. You know, it'll go from 15 to 20 percent this year because of the coronavirus, and Amazon is going to be a huge beneficiary of that. Here we have. Um, let's see, we have many questions. One of them is, um, yeah, this is Felix, and he's saying, could you tell us what were the red flags that you saw this uh, with Bill Ackman when you shorted MBIA? With that um, AAA credit rated healthy company, yeah. Yeah, um, what I would suggest is, is if you simply Google Bill Ackman is MBIA AAA, I'm pretty sure the report is still out there on the internet. If not, I can send it to you, Mark, and you can distribute it to your students. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But um, it's easy to find. It's 60 pages. and It is an absolutely one of the best pieces of analytical work ever. But here's the problem is that would, was stock was not a good short for five years. So he, MBIA is, was insuring bonds, but in, um, it was to some extent what they write as hurricane insurance. And they were underpricing it. They were over levered and underpricing it because they started writing insurance, not just on municipal bonds, which are really safe, but on structured derivative products, uh, RMBSs, CDOs, CDSs, that kind of thing, right? So they were doing very foolish things. And Bill pointed that out, that they were doing foolish things and they were levered 180 to one or something crazy, right? Um, but the point is, is that stock did not work as a short for five years. The stock doubled because the, how does, a, a, if an insurance company is underpricing hurricane risk, what's the catalyst? Well, obviously a hurricane. But until a hurricane comes along, that company looks awfully profitable. And that's exactly what happened with MBIA. So the key, it was a good lesson in, in you don't want to short that kind of company until you're sure of a catalyst. So the time to short MBIA was on the eve of the financial crisis or even after the financial crisis had started. So in other words, you could the best time to short the Titanic wasn't as it disappeared under the ocean, because by then everyone can see it's going to sink. 
The best time to short the Titanic, though, wasn't when it was just steaming merrily along, okay? What you want to do is you want to short things after they hit the iceberg, but while the band is still playing and everybody thinks things are fine, right? So Bill Ackman, just last month, saw the coronavirus, two months ago in January, he saw the coronavirus, he correctly anticipated that it was going to be hellish, and he found out the perfect way to play it. He bought credit default swaps on, on baskets of debt, which were at that point trading at all time lows. And in particular, he looked for companies that he felt would, run, would not be able to service their debt. So indebted companies, if they lost their revenue for a month or two months or three months. And he turned $27 million into $2.7 billion in a month. It was a hundred bagger in a month. It's public information. Just Google it. Um, now you might say, "Oh, he made all his profit or whatever." Actually, at this exact same month that he made two point seven billion, he lost two point seven billion in all the stocks he owned: Hilton, Starbucks, Lowe's uh, hardware stores, Berkshire Hathaway. So, in other words, if he at a time when the market fell twenty five percent or so, his fund was flat. Because he had 11, he had a 12 position portfolio, 11 of which got massacred, and one of which was the greatest single investment of all time. I would argue, I would argue in the history of investing, nobody has made as much money as quickly, as smartly um, than that single investment. And just to compensate the rest of the. And of all the he did yeah. was end up flat. Now, by yeah. the way, right at the bottom. He was even smarter than that. Right at the bottom, he took, I begged him, I begged him. That hedge was 40%, 40% of his fund after it went up 100X, right? I begged him to take it off because it could just as easily retrace. And I told him, I showed him my data and I said, we're gonna get through this. And that hedge is gonna go down in value a lot. It's 40% of your fund. Um, and he did, he, and I'm sure he would have done it without me telling him, but um, he, he took 100% of it off, banked the profit. That's the other reason, because a lot of people make a lot of money and then they stick around too long and get clobbered when it comes back in, right? Mm -hmm. So um, he, um, he took it all off and he took the entire proceeds and plowed it back into buying more Berkshire, more Starbucks, more Hilton, all his favorite stocks. He just bought a ton more. So as of a day or two ago, uh, maybe it was last Friday, he was up 12% on the year. So at the time, two weeks ago at the, at the very bottom um, or whatever, he was flat on the year because that hedge had offset all the big losses. But then the fact that he cashed in the hedge, put the money into stocks um, has now paid off. Excellent. So maybe we'll have time just for one last question. Um, sure. I don't know if anyone wants to jump in with a question. I had a question on lumber liquidators. Oh yeah. <laughs> I was wondering, uh, given that's the, the trade you made on the short side, uh, a lot of money. I was, I was just wondering how you came about finding out that the, the wood that they were using had the toxicity that you found from Chinese manufacturers. What was the bottom up research methodology? Maybe this is probably what, yeah. How you how you look at most stocks? Um, how did you come about that? Yeah. Well, the answer is is um, I have a broad network of people who I share ideas with, and um, um, and a friend of mine sent me a one sentence email. By the way, someone to this day I have never met. He's a fund manager out on the West Coast, and he said, "Whitney, take a look at LL. You'll like, like it. it." And he didn't even say long or short. And I took a look, and the stock had ripped from $12 to uh, almost $100 at the time within 18 months. Margins were expanding. They had just gotten raided by two federal agencies for um, sourcing um, illegal wood that had been harvested in Siberia and smuggled into China. So the, the company, the stock was trading at 55 times earnings. It was like the perfect short, perfect short. Um, so sure enough, I put the short on, but at the time I only had a couple of hints. I didn't know that they had a formaldehyde problem, that they were sourcing toxic flooring in China. So this was not the hardwoods harvested in areas that were environmentally protected problem. This was a completely separate problem where to make laminated wood, um, the cheap flooring, 
you have to use glue to, to glue the wood together. And that glue contained, uh, some glues contain high levels of formaldehyde, which is a dangerous chemical. It's an eye, eye. ear, eye, nose and throat irritant. Um, and it's illegal. Certain levels of it are illegal in the United States. So I didn't know about that problem at the time. Um, so what was the key? How did I figure it out? I went and spoke about it at a conference, a big conference, the Robin Hood Investors Conference with 1,500 people in the room. I made the presentation, not even talking about formaldehyde, just about the valuation. And they had this problem of sourcing the illegal wood and all of that. The stock dropped 10% the next day. So it was a very compelling presentation. But part of the reason I went public is, is that I thought that they might have more sourcing problems. I wasn't sure where. So I thought that by going public with that, um, somebody might come out of the woodwork and contact me. And six months later, it didn't happen immediately. Six months later, a guy, uh, an American, who had worked in the flooring industry in China for a big, uh, a big foreign company um, came to me and said, you know, Whitney, you got the story right about their sourcing and all, but, um, but what you're missing is, is there's this formaldehyde story. And so, um, um, so uh, he, that's, he's, he's the one who told me, he knew what was happening because he was on the ground in China and he was competing against companies who were supplying lumber liquidators with toxic product. And he wasn't willing to do it, but that meant his prices were higher. And so he was frustrated that he wasn't able to sell to lumber liquidators because lumber liquidators were just hitting the low bid and buying the bad product. So long story short, I decided to take that story to 60 Minutes. They got hidden cameras into the factories in China um, and the company completely blew up, went down by 90%. It was, uh, it was one of the, uh, it was one of the great, but by the way, Mark, I will send you, I, I don't think it's public. I noticed that someone was sending a link around. If yeah. you cannot find the link to the 13 minute story expose, it's one of the great pieces of journalism of all time. And of course, the fact that I, I play a role in the story makes me biased, but it's, it's well worth watching that 13 minute segment. If, if you can't find it, I have it posted Excellent. privately on my YouTube page, so I could send you the link. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, Whitney, I think it's, it's time. So th thank you so much for joining us today. My and, pleasure. Uh, I thank hope you. things get better here in New York and it looks like they are. Yeah. Also, thank you for all your work in, this, in these past few days, right? You were volunteering there, setting up like a campaign hospital in, in Central Park. Yeah, it's been, it's been crazy um, r directly across the street. You know what? I'll show you a picture. Um, and by, I, I sent you the video, Mark, right? Of yeah, my, I'll, share it, um, I'll share it with the class. I, I have not done yeah. it yet. Yeah, if you, if you watch my video in the first few minutes, uh, as I'm describing the story, I show some pictures. But literally, I live right across the street from Central Park. Um, two weeks ago, they set up a field hospital there. And... Um, uh, it's uh, with tents and everything and 68 critical care beds treating only coronavirus patients. And so I walked across the street the first day they came. Uh, a friend of mine was over there and said, hey, you want to come over and help? And I did. And so I've been over there 12 hours a day every day since then, um, you know, hauling, hauling wood chips to lay down pathways. I've been going to Costco and buying food and drinks for all the doctors and nurses so that, you know, in the middle of the night when they come off a shift, they've got something to eat. Um, you know, they, they, they don't have any way to get mail. None of these people are from New York. They've all driven in from around the country. Um, so they have no way to get, have their friends and family send them mail and packages. So they send them to me and then I deliver them to the camp, right? So I, I've just tried to be helpful um, so that they can focus on healing and saving lives of my fellow New Yorkers. I'm very grateful to them for coming here and helping. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. And uh, we send you right. here a virtual, a virtual ovation, you know. That <laughs> thank you. So. Um, and uh, I hope you guys, uh, I hope the trends continue for you guys and you guys can get back to normal soon as well. Uh, I love much. Spain. I love Barcelona. I had, I've had uh, I've only been to Barcelona once, but I definitely want to come back. It's uh, yes. one of my favorite cities. So let me know when that happens. <laughs> yeah, we'll do some rock climbing and uh, of touring. Exactly. Excellent. Right, Thank you care, so much. Everybody. Thank you. Take care. Right, Bye. Bye-bye.